You're listening to a content production of Higher Things. Higher Things is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to make the gifts of Christ Jesus known to youth and young adults through gospel rich content like you are about to hear. Consider joining our supporters who make this ministry possible by donating at higherthings.org slash giving, or by clicking the link in the show notes. And now, Higher Things presents Why Bodies Matter with hosts Erica Sorensen and Pastor Harrison Goodman. Understand that everything which was Christ's is now yours, and that shapes your identity. Well, welcome everyone to Why Bodies Matter, a podcast produced by Higher Things for youth and their adults too. The title of today's episode is Bodies Matter in Childhood. I'm your host, Erica Sorensen, along with Pastor Harrison Goodman. Hey. Hey, Pastor Goodman, would you introduce our guest today? I'm super excited. Uh, we have with us Pastor Bob Sunquist. He uh, he serves as pastor of educational ministries at Faith Community Lutheran Church in Vegas. Uh, he is the adjunct professor for Concordia University, Irvine, and uh, Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Uh, his Melissa teaches theology at Faith Lutheran High School, and he is also father to three daughters who are never-ending senses of joy and humor to him. How you doing, friend? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it's it. It's a privilege. Lots of theologians in your house. Yeah, there, there's lots of theology. That's probably the only thing that gets discussed with much excitement and vigor besides my wife's love for hockey. You're doing oh. something right then. Yeah, absolutely. You guys are sports sports fanatics in various ways and very busy. So I'm looking forward to like talking about that in our interview today. Um, so let, should we jump right in? Let's talk Let's about go. childhood. My, well, now looking back, it's my favorite time, but during I was that, say. I was pretty annoyed by, uh, not being an adult and being able to do what I wanted to do, but that, that's just me. I think that's pretty common. Oh man. Annoyed childhood almost broke me. I, I mean, really it just, it, it was, those were some of the darker years of my life. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's scary out there. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, yet there's some good things. We tend to look back on our childhood with some nostalgia, but so, so, uh, Pastor Sunquist, let's talk about, let's talk about how our bodies matter in childhood. We've been talking, uh, this season about our inc- incarnational faith. And so can you just give us a, an answer about how does that relate to childhood? How does this incarnational faith kind of matter in, in our childhood bodies? Because we don't always they, love those childhood bodies. They can't do all the things. <laughs> they can't do all the things and they can't, uh, they can't understand why some things and not another. I think one of the most important things to reinforce in childhood um, is to reinforce the fact that, that we have been created by God. And so really it's, it's about unpacking the first article of the creed with, with your kids and just saying, Hey, um, cause, uh, the reason why this happens is because God created it that way. And the reason why um, this doesn't happen is because this is the way that God created it. Um, it's really important to reinforce that all the time because it sets a foundation and an expectation for our being as a creature created by God. Because the narrative out there in the world is going to tell them all other different kinds of things about naturalism and idealism and all these kinds of things or, or deconstructionism. They're going to tell them that they were not created that way, that that's a con- they'll tell them that that's a construct that's put on them in society um, and yeah. they'll try and rob them of their createdness. And so it's super important, first off, to always talk about how, how God created things that God created things and, and why God created things. And so um, I, have a, I have a fun story, if that's okay. Oh, Absolutely. we love stories. Yes. My 10-year-old, and 10-year-olds are real great about asking questions. She wants to know the, the reason why for so many things. And, um, <laughs> and she asked why the sky was the color blue um, and, uh, and not some other different colors. And I said, well, um, that's a question I can't answer, but I know that God created it blue. Um, and, and that's not an attempt for me to shut her down, but it's an intent for, 
it's intended for me to reinforce to her that that some of these decisions and some of these things about knowing the world are outside of our our control and our sphere of influence, but they do come from a creator God. And so, and she's content with that and she's going to continue to learn the science on that, um, which will not contradict the fact that these things were created by God. Another, uh, so that's the first answer. I would, I would go to the first article of the creed and I would talk about how we were created and given a body and, and eyes and ears and a soul and and our reason and all these things. And just constantly reinforcing that always puts us in the best position to understand the truth of the world around us, which will then lead into uh, hopefully a second conversation, which leads into the second article of the creed. But I don't know where you guys want to go. Well, we'll, I think we'll definitely get there. Um, I think one of the things that I thought about when you were talking about that is Um, I know for a lot of kids, they, um, particularly in childhood, they're kind of shuttled around, right? They got to go to school. They got to go. Sometimes if parents are divorced, they got to go back and forth from home to home. And, um, and, you know, even at times it's like, oh, you got to go hug grandma or you got to do this or, you know, I think that a lot of times they feel like they don't necessarily, they're just kind of put where they're put. Um, and feel powerless in some ways. And some and, and sometimes that's good, right? Because if you're in a caring, loving, nested environment like that, um, it's good. But there are times where childhood is is not so good. And sometimes you feel out of control. Um, what kind of, what can, what can we say about that as Christians? Um, that, you know, okay, God made this body and I get that, but I kind of feel like I get maybe shuttled around or I don't have any sort of autonomy over where I am or what I'm doing. What do you, what can you say about that? Cause I know our 11 year old struggles with that too, um, in various ways. Yeah. This is where the second article of the creed actually comes in because whereas God created everything good and it's proper order in the first article, there's this problem that we have in the world that's sometimes caused by, uh, the limitations of that have been placed upon us or things that happen to us or, or things that we are forced into. Um, sometimes there's even like sin and brokenness. And so um, understanding that I've been created by God, then, but, but then looking at the world and saying, but all this kind of stuff is broken and I don't like this and I don't understand that. And, and so now what do I do? How, how do I set a frame there? And that's when we bring in the second article of the creed and we say, um, and God has sent Jesus into our world as a real person. And he knows what it's like to be taken where he doesn't want to go. And he knows what it's like to be put in a situation where there's a lot of stress and confusion. And he knows how important it is sometimes to uh, seek silence or solitude. And he understands. So in the second article of the creed, we have, um, we have something where God creates understanding through the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus has a shared experience with our humanity. And so if we're ever in those moments um, where, where we're trying to seek understanding in the midst of a broken world, the best thing to do um, to, for children is to get them with Jesus and, and to create understanding moments with Jesus and to listen to what their concerns are and then it's on us as parents, or through the guiding of the Holy Spirit, I, I never want to mess that up, but I think we'll hit that later, um, yeah. to listen to what they say, and then to find something in what they're saying in a story of Jesus that we can say, you know, that reminds me of a time when. Hmm. And so that they can see that Jesus is um, is connected to them through his flesh. So... I think um, in a lot of ways, uh, we, we don't give the kids enough credit. Uh, we, we we talk about the kids like they can't think fast enough. They can't quite understand. I think usually the issue that our kids are running into is that they think too fast. They're actually, they're, they, 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 they jump to conclusions. And in some cases, we actually have to, to take a step back and look at it. You, you painted a picture uh, over and over again of something that, that I just kind of want to call attention to. You always return to what is before you would go to how do you feel about it or what do you think about it? Uh, we, we always want to jump in. We look around the creation. And, and we start with ideas. We start with with you know all these these connections that we see. Um, but but to just start with the, this is what is. You are a creature. And then when I don't like how creation looks, instead of like how do you feel about that or what do you think about that, you go to what is Christ. 
Christ joined us here. Um, it, it's it's a very foundational way to think, but it also sort of flies in the face of what we do with you know these things here, these cell phone things that I don't think are going away anytime soon, where we have only ideas. We have only sort of how do you think and how do you what's your dopamine from it? Um, there there's a disconnect uh, from the internet that that I, I don't know if it's doing any favors for community. What what kind of dangers? Does, does starting with the you know what do you think or feel about it the the disconnect what does that do to our community and and why honestly i've i've got to say that i i think that the technologies that are around us and the disconnects that you're talking about are so dangerous because they they're reflections of ourself or they play to our sinful nature and so they they force us deeper into ourselves and and our biblical anthrop- our biblical uh, belief is true um, we are by nature sinful. So if I'm going to if I'm going to dig deeper into my nature, I'm not going to pull out anything good. And hmm. so I that disconnect is is a fatal flaw, which is why you always have to return people back to who they who they are, um, who they were created to be, um, because any form of self reflection um, is is very very dangerous. So the cell phone. Uh, plays off of a reaction that happens inside of you. Um, the connection mm-hmm. to the screen um, plays off of uh, a desire that you have. It's it's separate from who you are and who you were made to be. And I think that's the danger. Um, one of the things that I think ends up happening as well when people disconnect from reality into this virtual world or this virtual imaginarium is um, they actually lose the ability to think creatively and critically Mm -hmm. because they're constantly, instead of thinking through it themselves, and since they're just kind of going with what's given to them, which makes them um, a product, um, what ends up happening is they can't, they can't critically evaluate. And then they, they can't even be creative, which is, which is super dangerous um, because in our created state, God has made us to be creative people. And so it's robbing us of these fundamental building blocks in our createdness and our creatureliness. Um, not that I'm against screens. I mean, I got to make dinner too, just like every other parent on the planet. <laughs> and so, yeah. but I think that you have to be wise as to um, as to how you're engaging it, and then never losing track of your identity. What it, you need to be reminded as a parent, as much as you're reminding your child, that the values that we have are not something simply that I say, but it's something that we all do and we all value together, um, which yeah. leads to a great moment of confession and absolution if you need to. You know? Absolutely. You know, one of the things that you said, I thought that was really powerful about that, you know, as a former classroom teacher too, that kind of both had a love-hate relationship with the internet as well, because there is access to wonderful, educational, wholesome stuff out there. There are some real good benefits to the internet. So we're not- or, Higherthings.org. Right. Right. Yeah. We're not, we're not saying that, you know, um, to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but as you said, it's very dangerous. And, and one of the things I know from human development and psychology is, um, your childhood years. And we complain that about this as children too, kids. So I'm, 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 I, I'm, I, I lived what I'm preaching here, but, um, is you're supposed to be a little bored. You talked about creativity in childhood. And um, I think one of the concerns I have in seeing people develop their minds and their ability to reason is that creativity is an incredible part of that. And frankly, we can't be creative with our hands and our bodies um, in play and in, and in you know, playing tag and touching one another and playing games. Um, and gosh, I remember sending my son outside. He was mad at me too because, you know, took away the screens. Um, but then just seeing him playing with sticks and digging in the yard and just coming in sort of happy. Um, and, and, and even though he really didn't do anything and I'm not entirely sure what he learned while he was doing that, but I do know that he was creative and, you know, ended up playing with friends and so forth. And we need how, let's talk a little bit about that creativity and, and sort of how we need that and to be in our bodies away, away from these things and sort of God's creation with God's creatures. How does that kind of help us in childhood? How can we sort of think about those things? 
creativity is the key to being an intelligent and uh, connected person in the world. So, I mean, there's lots of great studies with that. But I think all the way back to um, to creation, um, not that I was there, but I think back to Genesis <laughs> chapter two. That's a little qualifier there. Um, yeah. Adam, God sent Adam into the world and he sent him out to go and interact, to go and, and name mm-hmm. things. So that takes creativity. And and actually in the creation account, the only time that God says um, some, that something's not good before the fall is that Adam was alone. It's not good yeah. for him to be alone. And so one of the things about engaging um, creation and your createdness is to engage with other people and to engage in an act of creation. And so that's that's a good and godly thing. I mean, that's the third article of the creed, right? So if the mm-hmm. first one says that we are created and the second one says that we live in a broken creation and it needs to be restored through Jesus, redeemed by Christ, then the third article of the creed says it's not good for us to be alone. You know, so get out there and and be creative and have fun with other people. Find cardboard and glue and scissors. Find um, sheets of paper that need to be um, filled with with new ideas and, and artwork. And find uh, things that need to be built or games that need to be play played. Um, because yeah. one of the things that technology does is it turns us into individuals um, in, yeah. in a negative way, and it 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 makes the whole experience centered on the me. Um, and it deprives you of this God created gift of otherness. And so yeah. going back to Adam and um, what he did in the garden and how it was not good for him to be alone. And then pulling from the third article of the creed that we belong to this great body of Christ, um, I think is, is very healthy. So if you're a kid, it's time to resurrect that good old fashioned, uh, find other kids, play games, have fun, be safe. Um, now we, all of us in the, in the, in this dialogue right now, we grew up in an era where kids still played outside. Right. Yeah. And I don't know, I I think the world is a different place. Um, but I think it's a trust exercise as parents also that we can, um, raise our kids up and then provide for them opportunities to engage in, um, safe play as well. And just trust that it's going to happen. And they're going to come home with bumps and bruises and hurt feelings and all those kinds of things. And that's okay because that's a part of um, just being in in the world in a healthy way. Well, I have a question for you. I kind of have appointed myself this time the uh, voice of children listening to this with objections and so forth. Yeah, yeah, go for it. I'm already thinking about the objections I would get in having a conversation with the 11-year-old. But what about um, what about this kind of objection? And I can give you a couple of interesting stories too, but um, I could see a child object, objecting going, well, you know, you kind of don't understand my generation there. I'll be socially sort of cut off if I'm not on the screen. And then on top of it, interacting with other kids, particularly, and I've got a middle, middle schooler, um, can be really hard because they can be mean. You can get bullied and so forth. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about with my daughter when she was in about third grade. She um, she had a best friend named Bella. They went to school together. They did everything together. Um, and they walked up and down the halls holding hands after recess and so forth. And um, and that, there's another there's another story about recess too. But um, they were teased for being gay because they were holding hands and touching and you know and playing and so forth. And um, here's my second story. Um, the other story is um, I know of a school district um, that. Uh, cut down recess to seven minutes to keep the kids from playing tag because they were touching each other too much and it was just getting too wild. But they were able to, you know, this way they were able to kind of control it and have no problems and sort of, you know, shelter the kids from really, in in my opinion, interacting with, with each other and learning those kind of social skills. But I can tell you right now, those are probably the objections I would hear from our 11 year old is like, well, other kids are mean. Um, and when I'm online, I can kind of control the engagement, right? I can, I can text when I want to, I can, um, I have a little bit more control and it, it, it's one step removed. So it's not as scary and doesn't fe- make, doesn't make me feel as bad when somebody's mean to me. So how can, how can we kind of address that issue? How can we kind of talk about that in a helpful way? 
I, I completely agree with all of those troubles and all those objections. I have a middle schooler myself. I understand how this goes. It's um, the answer is not to, um, I mean, not to be more of an individual. The answer is to uh, is to pull out some other uh, God created virtues um, and to try them out and to fail and to try them out and to succeed and to, to try them out because these are virtues that have been created by God as well. Um, and it's, it's the virtues of courage and, yeah. and fortitude and, and temperance. You know, these, these are God created things um, that, that we must exercise because then the only alternative, if we don't, if we don't have courage and if we don't have fortitude, um, then, then we're actually being controlled instead of controlling. We think we're controlling the situation, but we're not. We're being controlled because we're we're constantly being forced into smaller and smaller spaces, um, and lonelier that, spaces. Exactly, and so yeah. at the same time that there's a rise in, in connectivity um, that we feel like we can control, there's an arise there's a rise in depression, and there's yeah. a, a rise in isolation and and loneliness, and so. It's time to start engaging those other God created virtues of, of courage, you know, have courage. Um, and I think and understanding that we'll fail in those social okay. interactions sometimes, sometimes too. And I think, I think we get this idea also from being online. I mean, I know I do as well, as well as the kids of, um, you can almost project more of a perfect person in that world or. <laughs> Or um, it's less likely to make mistakes, but I think that contrasting to that is is the understanding that we are not always going to be perfect in our social interactions. But not only do I need other people in social interactions, but maybe maybe the Holy Spirit needs to work through me too with my peers and understanding that that's not always going to go perfectly. And just like anything that's sort of difficult, and this is this is the lesson the eleven year eleven year old really hates, is that. I'm not perfect the first time, you know, I, like it didn't work. So I don't want to try it again. Yeah, that's um, it right. was hard and it backfired and what you said didn't work. Um, but, but, but we can encourage them, I think too, because not only do you need your friends, but what if they need you? I, that's exactly correct. I, can I push in on that? I just want to push yes, in on that. Yes, please, please. Okay. Yeah. I have a I have a 14 year old who just moved from second chair violin to third chair and it just annihilated her. She's in middle school. Yeah, yeah. And um, and she's having a really rough time. I gave her. I told her. I says. I, I told her. I said. I'm going to give you space to feel this because the hurt is real. I said. But I just want you to know we are going to talk about it. But when you're ready, um, and and if you're not ready, I may have to keep checking back. And so she was finally ready, and all she wanted was a hug. Yeah. And I told her, I said, your position in orchestra is not your position in life, mm -hmm. you know, um, and just kind of rerouting her and her identity as a child of God to say, that's what gives you meaning is that I think what ha I think there's a very interesting phenomenon um, that uh, a guy named Charles Taylor points out is that the modern person has created over themselves this kind of armor against being hurt in a broken world and it's a self-made armor that looks like a mosaic and we need it to be a mosaic because we need to be able to remove something and replace it with another thing um, at whim and at will and so we're all these mosaics of what we want the world to see but all that is is armor because the real person is is on the other side of that and what this mosaic does is it prevents other people from truly engaging us. Yeah. And so, um, so we, we are all these mosaics and you can see this on social media. We are all these managed images of status that tell people I'm powerful. I'm strong. I'm beautiful. I'm smart. I'm funny. I'm smart. Um, all these kinds of things. But on the inside, I'm actually really scared that I'm not that smart and I'm really scared that I'm not, perfectly beautiful and i'm really scared or special that I'm not, yeah we're special or unique or yeah because again you, we're, trying, we're trying to make our identity ourselves instead of re, instead of accepting that we have an identity that we were created in and redeemed in 
Does that make sense? Exactly. Yeah, you're talking about an identity that would shape the body rather than a body that would shape an identity, and and it's a dangerous, dangerous lie of the evil one. But this society is uh, has sort of bought hook, line, and sinker into this. And I mean, it, it doesn't only sort of color things like like what gender are you, um, but but even just sort of can you can you look at yourself outside of how you're doing in orchestra and actually be content with life? Um, I, I think we've kind of painted some of the pictures of the dangers of this, but can we lean a little bit more on like where does this where's the the seed that this this awful tree grows from and, and what what kind of awful fruit hangs from it well it comes from um it's kind of funny that you say fruit because the book of galatians talks about this uh really really well especially galatians chapter four there's this it, it's it you know nobody's out there scaring anybody with this idea that you'll go to hell or you'll be damned right but instead they're 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 using the positive form of fear to entrap people, meaning um, you want to be better, don't you? You want to be the best, don't mm. you? Well, if you want to be better and if you want to be the best, then you have to do these things. And so it's the law that drives it, but not a, a lot, not in a law that makes me feel afraid, but in a law that says, no, this is good. You know, mm -hmm. it's doable. Um, it's doable. Yeah. And if you would just do it, I mean, have you done it yet? Are, are you good enough yet? And so it's this idea that there's some other kind of best or good, better, or this other fullness out there um, that we haven't experienced yet that drives us mad. And it's a law we put on ourselves. The world is out there saying you need to perform better, try harder, and then you'll have a better life. The world is out there saying it's up to you to make the world a better place. You know, you have to be concerned about the environment because if, you, if you're not, the world's going to go down and it's all up to you to save it. And then there's this idea that um, you know, unless we join the right cause and do all these right things, then the world's going to be awful. And it's, it's all on us. That's how it starts. It starts with the law um, instead of accepting that. And, and the law can't change anything. It can only, it only smashes us. The yeah. only thing that actually can change people is the gospel. And so we have to start with the gospel in order to see a different image than the one we're trying to manage. And it's the image of Christ. You see how that works? Yeah. And so that's the root. The root is not bad awfulness. The root is this, hey, are you enough yet? Hey, are, don't you want to be better? Hey, did you know that there's something that can make your life better if you just do it? That's where it all starts. So where is this gospel for kids then? How could we, if we're going to sign out today, um, I know we've used this term gospel and we, we've talked about it quite a, quite a lot, but I want to kind of leave leave the kids with, um, a re something to to cling on to here at the end. What what is that gospel for kids? How is everything going to be okay? If I were to point again to Galatians chapter four, I'd probably point to verse six, where Paul does something really strange. He has he has uh, the people uh, in the churches in Galatia. He has them call God Abba, and and that's just really weird. It's really weird because they don't use that term at all. They're a bunch of Greek speakers, right? They should use the word pater. But he says, you call God Abba. And they're probably confused going, wait, isn't that like an Aramaic word? And the answer is, yes, it is. He, he points out a weird word and he says that we should use it because that's the exact word that Jesus used when he was talking about his father. So the same word way that Jesus calls on the Father is the same way you get a call on the Father. And the same way that, um, uh, you know, Jesus has access to the family, you have that access to the family. It's not that you're a part of the family. You are in the family as much as Jesus is. And it's not that you have some access to the Father. You have the same access that Jesus does. Um, so everything which is true of Christ um, is true for you. And that's the gospel, that your identity is in Christ. Your identity is not in any anything else that's going to give you meaning or security or purpose. It's Christ. And so start by calling God Abba, which will feel weird. But don't do it in that kind of corny way where it's like, you know, you know, daddy prayers or, so, or something like that. Yeah, but, I don't like that. <laughs> I, I don't do that. What I mean is, understand that everything which was Christ is now yours. And that shapes your identity. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to want anything after that because you There's have freedom everything. in that. 
Yeah, yeah, there's freedom in that. There's free to explore childhood. There's free to do fun things. There's free to engage. Free to make some mistakes. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. Free, free. And I think that's a be- that's a beautiful gospel, not just for the kids who are listening, but they're they're adults too, because we have that same freedom, and the kids do too. They are, they are as redeemed as we are by the gospel and by the work of Jesus. Yeah, awesome. So I hope that's that's. That's uh, a gospel that they can go with. And it comes straight from Galatians 4, 6, which is good stuff. It is good stuff. Well, I don't have any other questions today. Do you, Pastor Goodman? No, I've uh, really enjoyed the ride. Thank you very much for being with us here today. Got Thank to be a kid that. again. Think like a kid again a little bit. I love it. Yeah, get um, out your crayons. Yes, I might. I just might do that. Pastor Sunquist, it has been a joy to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us to talk about our faith in the flesh in this disembodied age. It turns out there is hope, all kinds of hope. Thank you. Thank you, guys.